I joined GCHQ in 1969 as a young analyst. Uh, and in those days, of course, it had no legal personality. It, it, it was secret. You weren't even supposed to tell your parents where you were working. All that has changed now and for the better. And it is now a recognised and valuable jewel in, in the British crown. Tell, tell us a bit about why GCHQ exists. It's been in existence for more than 100 years now. Yes, they, we celebrated its 50th anniversary only, um, only a few years ago. Um, it, it, you can say it exists, has existed basically since the end of the First World War, when the various um, Ministry of Defence departments dealing with signals um, were merged to become GC and CS, which is what became Bletchley. It didn't become GCHQ until the end of the Second World War. Um, but it took over all the earlier functions of um, gathering communications intelligence, cryptography, um, our protection against uh, foreign um, code breakers, all of that. And David, explain to us the difference then. How is GCHQ different to uh, MI5 or MI6 that people might have seen in films? MI5 is Britain's security service. So that's the domestic security operating largely through uh, human intelligence. Uh, MI6, or the Secret Intelligence Service, both names apply, uh, collects intelligence through running agents uh, Overseas on targets overseas. GCHQ, if you like, it's the technical uh, side. It's these days very much a digital agency and cyber security agency. But following what Francis has just said, what I find remarkable is how very quickly uh, Britain followed the invention of radio Marconi. Uh, his first experiments only took place a few years before the First World War, and yet by 1914, you have the world's first signals intelligence station being set up at Scarborough on the northeast coast in order to monitor transmissions from the German Grand Fleet, who had installed radio, uh, find out where they were, find out if they were still at sea. And Scarborough is still today a GCHQ uh, signals intelligence station. Is that, uh, I suppose, is that a reflection then, David, that each time a new technology comes along, pretty soon afterwards, it, it starts being used by baddies and therefore uh, the intelligence services have to get to grips with it? Yes, and starts being used by goodies as well. <laughs> well, exactly, yes. <laughs> Go on, Francis, explain, explain what you mean by that as well. Well, what I mean by that is that um, essentially you always have to stay one jump ahead of the baddies, whoever they are, um, because your own communications have to be impenetrable to their efforts to crack them. Uh, so you're not playing a purely reactive game at all. You're trying to be at the frontier. And you were both um, at GCHQ in the mid 90s, early noughties, where clearly the internet was a was a big and emerging thing. David, you were there, what, from 96, 97? Yes. Describe then trying to get to grips with the internet. At what point does the security service think, no, I think this internet thing might catch on? The arrival of what I describe as digitization, the fact that you could take any form of communication, uh, text, speech, video, uh, any information can be turned into numbers. And once you have numbers, uh, you can then uh, transmit information extremely efficiently. But once you've got information uh, in the form of numbers, it's quite cheap to store it. It's cheap to transmit it. Uh, you can search it very readily. All of these things uh, arrived around the noughties. Uh, by the mid 1990s, when I was at GCHQ, you could see the first traces of what 
you would call a digital intelligence, gathering information from streams of data, no longer transmitted by radio waves, but instead carried uh, uh, by satellite microwave links uh, and uh, uh, fiber optic cables. The internet itself didn't really become popularized uh, for a few years beyond that. It was very much business and governments. Uh, very few private individuals had uh, 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 internet accounts. What I think really transformed things was then uh, the introduction of mobile devices. So the, the mobile phones we used to have in those days, analog phones, became digital. Uh, the uh, iPads, the uh, laptop computers became ubiquitous. And that just led to an explosion of information being passed around the globe, uh, creating opportunities for intelligence agencies, but also at that very moment, creating opportunities for the bad guys to start uh, what today you would call cyber attacks, to start uh, stealing information, stealing intellectual property, uh, carrying out acts of sabotage on our system by hacking into our devices. So it's a complete transformation of, in the space of really what, 20 years. And Francis, I suppose on the one hand, it means there's more information flying around. So from a G GCHQ perspective, You've got more chance of of getting into it, but the 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 when you're looking for the needle, the haystack's also much bigger. There's just more. Absolutely, more, absolutely. Yeah. No, in in um, David's and my time at GCHQ, the vast majority of our business was with traditional means of communication. We could see this digital tsunami coming. We knew it would be with us within ten years, and at the time, we simply weren't capable of handling those volumes of data. And I think most of what David and I did during our time was to prepare for that, um, that huge increase in um, our capacity. And when we talk, we've used the phrase good guys and bad guys uh, quite a lot already. Um, Francis, is there a, I suppose over time, who the good guys and the bad guys are changes, both for political reasons, diplomatic reasons, economic reasons. Are we constantly spying on everyone um, or, or, or are there a list of countries or organisations that you're allowed to spy on? And, you know, so you are allowed to spy on Russia, but not on Germany. I don't know, is, that, is that how it works? It doesn't really work like that. Um, we have a list of requirements that um, we don't task ourselves. We're tasked by government um, to pursue a whole series of intelligence requirements. And we go where it's necessary in order to find that. And there are countries, of course, which are completely off limits. And our intelligence alliance, um, the Five Eyes, um, is so close that we couldn't possibly um, spy on each other. It would be unthinkable, and we just don't do it. Just remind me the Otherwise, countries in that. Um, we are we're a bit constrained. Um, you know, we don't spend a great deal of time spying on friendly countries. Um, it really depends where there are threats to our interests emerging. Just remind me the five eyes. That's America. America, Canada, Australia, us, New Zealand. That's right. And so it's so close that you wouldn't be, you, yeah, you're, you're all on the same teams. So you wouldn't necessarily be spying on them. And what about spies? And again, you know, whenever we talk about spies, people will be thinking of in the films, David. But um, at various times when they've been, uh, diplomatic geopolitical uh, tensions between Britain and other countries. We will kick out people who we call spies. It happened after Russia invaded Ukraine. Does that mean we allow a certain amount of known spies to be in the country at any one time? Well, there are always oh, intelligence officers in a lot of um, foreign embassies in London, sometimes quite a lot of them. And they're there partly because we need to cooperate with other um, intelligence agencies, and even more so, really, with the advent of the internet, because we need cooperation. Um, if if we don't want to bump into each other in the dark <laughs> in, in the internet, um, we're very often pursuing the same targets. Sometimes we're not pretending to be GC. Well, we're never pretending to be GCHQ usually, um, but we might be pretending to be um, 
some extremist organization. And if we bump into another extremist organization, it's in fact Moroccan intelligence. <laughs> That's not very clever. <laughs> so on the whole, we have much more dialogue than we ever did in the past with foreign intelligence agencies. And my successors in GCHQ have personal relationships with um, heads of agencies on a far, far larger scale than I ever did. David, you have just to remember that you know there's there's a whole class of targets that you would regard as criminals, the cyber attackers, uh, the money launderers, the uh, those who are uh, conducting uh, uh, human trafficking, uh, serious and organised crime groups, who these days have enormous resources at their disposal. They make a great deal of money out of crime and assisting the police, the National Crime Agency, for example, it's one of the tasks that GCHQ undertakes. And actually, talk about resources and uh, allies. David, you said in 2013 of Britain's relationship with America, we have the brains, they have the money. It's a collaboration that's worked very well. Is that st that was, what, uh, 10 years ago? Is that still the case? Have we still got the brains and they, they've just got the money? I did say that it was a joke on the radio, <laughs> and it was uh, a reminder to never that. be very careful, never make jokes. But there's a grain of truth in it that uh, we have, as we said right at the very beginning, since the end of the First World War, we have had dedicated and extremely capable people working on these issues, and they come up with really smart, innovative ideas, and. This continues. One of the themes of the uh, current director has been diversity of views, diversity of mind, getting really smart people to think how you defeat the, the bad guys, how you get across their uh, communications. So that kind of work uh, uh, still goes on. It's really essential uh, that, it, that it does. Um, and so what what makes a good spy these days? You're talking about um, a diversity of thought, David, a move away from the tap on the shoulder at Oxbridge and all the same type of people doing the same type of work. Is that what you mean? Yes. And you've got to be careful when you use the word spy. <laughs> <laughs> really, we on the one hand, you have intelligence officers employed by the uh, intelligence agencies and their job is to organize the collection of intelligence when they're doing it uh, by rec recruiting human agents. It's the agent who is really the spy inside the uh, adversaries, uh, uh, military forces or whatever uh, it might be, or inside the terrorist uh, organization. Uh, what makes a good intelligence officer? Curiosity, integrity, there are a whole series of characteristics that you would certainly uh, look for, um, in some cases, bravery, uh, particularly working in a dangerous place uh, overseas, uh, trying to contact people who will want to help the United Kingdom. They believe in what we believe in. They believe in our values. They may have considerable difficulties with the local regime that may be, uh, for example, very violent. Just think of the current conflict uh, taking place in Ukraine at the moment, finding people who are prepared to tell us about what the Russians are actually up to. So that's the agent uh, intelligence officer relationship. In a place like GCHQ, you have a variety of skills that are needed. Some are very technical, uh, obviously very high uh, understanding of how the internet uh, and everything associated with the digital world works, but you also need very skilled linguists mm. and you need analysts. You need people who can see these different pieces of the jigsaw and put them together. And that involves uh, almost an intuitive flair as well, uh, obviously, as a lot of training. Francis, is it a bit like people who say they want to be prime minister? They, they, they should be excluded once they've even said that. Is, is there something about the sort of people who think they might like to be a spy should be immediately excluded? Well, we're encouraging a whole lot of people to want to be spies. Um, we all advertise for uh, for recruits on, on openly. You'll see posters on the uh, 
underground. Um, I have to add to, to what David said that um, the kind of people we're looking for has changed a great deal. Um, we're looking for a much more diverse range of people. And we're looking what's more for leaders. Um, SIG Inters used to be stereotypically um, rather, rather introverted types. They were immensely patient analysts. They were immensely skillful. Um, but they basically had been looking at one target and one target only, i.e. almost only, um, i.e. Russia, for 50 years. And with the end of the Cold War and this multiplicity of new threats, you needed a much greater flexibility and you needed um, really imaginative leaders. And I think it's a very, very different kind of person that is, is running the agencies now to the kind of people you'd have seen there uh, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. You, you mentioned Russia. Do you think that the West, having spent so long focusing on Russia and then, I mean, during your time especially, you know, turning his attention to Al-Qaeda, Islamic extremist groups, did the West take their eye off Russia, want to believe that the, the end of the Cold War meant it was no longer the same threat, Francis? Well, at GCHQ, I'd say not on my watch because I'm a <laughs> Russia, I'm a Russia hand. Um, I spent much of my career watching Russia and I was very conscious of um, the threat that um, a, a sick and unsuccessful Russia, which had failed to establish um, a lasting democratic framework um, and which felt um, a tremendous sense of failure and disappointment at the loss of great power status. Um, I thought that was very worrying. And even when the um, Russian government was not itself in the least malevolent, and it wasn't for most of the 1990s, um, it was the sort of, I used to compare it to a rotten tree, which harb harbored all sorts of disease, um, criminals. I mean, the, the kind of um, people who now pose a threat to our communications from Russia were there then, but they were, they were criminals, not, um, not at that time working in such large numbers as they do today for the government. Um, and do you think, David, that, that Russia as it stands can be defeated well you know clearly there's a there's a military battle going on with ukraine there's a economic battle going on with the sanctions and presumably there's an intelligence battle going on as well yes i think it, the important thing is that russia should not be able to gain from their flagrant breach of international law the invasion of a sovereign country a country which russian leader the president putin himself accepted in the 1990s, uh, when the Soviet Union broke up. So they must not be allowed to get away with that. Uh, but defeating Russia in the sense of uh, 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 the United States, other NATO countries uh, are not going to go to war with, I hope, with and need to go to war with Russia. Uh, but it is necessary they support Ukraine to the hilt to prevent Russian aggression in Ukraine. Did he do that? Can I qualify that, David? Yeah, of course. Just to say that, um, nonetheless, we have to take into account the fact that we are, in a sense, also at war with Russia, though it's not a hot war. I mean, they will use all the means at their disposal to undermine um, the solidarity of the West, to encourage those in the West who aren't there for the long haul, who feel that there must be an early negotiated end to this conflict, and we have to give Russia quite a lot in order to make that possible. And they will do that um, with all the tools at their disposal, and including their assaults on the whole concept of absolute truth. Um, and they poison our airwaves. I don't disagree with that at all. <laughs> but I, I would... NATO, we are, we are long-standing members of NATO. We were in there at the very beginning. NATO is a defense and deterrence doctrine. And if we hold firm, we should not and need not fear being in armed conflict with Russia. We've also got China to worry about. Mm. And we mustn't forget the enormous uh, intellectual property theft uh, mm. that China has conducted against uh, Western companies 
companies, including in the United Kingdom, her build up in the military sphere, her own activities and the threats she poses to the uh, to Taiwan, for example, all of which could create in the years to come very considerable trouble, which is why it is so important. We have places like GCHQ staffed with very, very uh, uh, clever um, and innovative people to keep an eye on those threats. And of course, we haven't talked in this conversation about terrorism. That hasn't gone away either. No, and I suppose it's 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 down to the success of the security services that we don't talk about that as much as we used to because, you know, touch woods, there haven't been the the, the, the big attacks, you know, so you'd hope this because they're they're stopping them. I want to ask you, although you've, you've mentioned China, a few weeks ago, all anyone was talking about was balloons spy balloons which struck me as distinctly un 21st century and and very analog uh the idea you know as you were talking about cyber attacks on businesses and intellectual property theft and uh and all of that are balloons a real threat david well you say analog but i have no doubt that hanging underneath that balloon was some extremely sophisticated digital interception kit looking for all forms of uh, 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 signatures from uh, 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 United States uh, military uh, and other communications. So, no, it, it, balloons have some advantage. Uh, as has been shown, they appear to have been flying over the United States for many years now, virtually undetected. Um, that has now changed and the parameters of detection have been altered. So now they're popping up. But uh, it, I think we probably make too much of the balloon. The, satel the satellite constellations, which uh, certainly Russia and, and, and China operate all the time, um, looking at us, for example, and uh, the NATO allies. That, I think, poses a far greater threat than the occasional balloon. <laughs> but all the balloon is, anyway, is, is simply a way of deploying um, fairly cheaply a very large quantity of sensors in a very low orbit, more or less geostationary. Yeah. Just another kind of satellite, really. Exactly, that's what I thought. I'd probably satellite mm. to do uh, much the same. Um, just um, last couple of things I wanted to ask you both: the highs and lows. What, when you look back on your time at GCHQ, um, when has something gone wrong that you're allowed to tell us about, that, an amusing story, perhaps, uh, and where is or, or or where something has gone particularly right against against the odds? When you look back, Francis, what what springs to mind? <laughs> Um, I really can't think of, of a story that I'm allowed to tell you, um, which fills that bill. <laughs> David, is there anything spring to mind for you? Or, or if you tell me this, this message, the whole message will have to destruct afterwards. No, I, but I, what I'd point to is the complexity, the difficulty of actually conducting this activity and the sense of continuing marvel that I have that we are so successful at it, because it does involve <clears throat> creating extremely complicated systems, electronic systems, digital systems, collecting information, huge quantities of it these days, using artificial intelligence these days to sift it and filter it and search it. Um, sometimes these projects go extremely well, sometimes they don't. And that's that, that sort of, uh, not every program that you launch and not every new idea is going to bear fruit. But the important thing is like a portfolio in investment terms. The important <laughs> thing is you have some really big wins that justify the effort you're putting in. And uh, the uh, authorized history of GCHQ, which came out last year by Professor John Ferrison, Canadian academic has got a whole list of from the Cold War era earlier and earlier extraordinary successes mm. uh, that signals intelligence have led to. Just finally, then looking ahead, I just come back. Oh, yeah, sorry, of course. Say, sorry. The one thing that gives me a real buzz um, is David and I spent our time um, at, at GCHQ in an organization in need of huge modernization. 
David developed a vision for that, and I spent my time after him trying to follow that up and implement some of it. Um, what gives me the buzz is going back now and seeing what we dreamt of. Um, it has been a colossal success. And so looking yes, into the future, I, then. I, then. I just Sorry, to that. I joined GCHQ in 1969 as a young analyst. Uh, and in those days, of course, it had no legal personality. It, it, it was secret. You weren't even supposed to tell your parents where you were working. All that has changed now and for the better. And it is now a recognised and valuable jewel in, in the British crown. And so looking ahead, uh, GCHQ now looking for a new director because uh, Sir Jeremy Fleming is going to stand down in the summer. What does the next 50 years look like? Or may, may, maybe that's a bit too far ahead. What are the challenges that, that GCHQ will be facing in maybe the next decade? The th where do the threats come from, from next, do you think, Francis? I'm afraid it's the same places. Um, I, I, there will be global competition with China. And there will be local, uh, we have a rogue state, a huge rogue state on our boundaries. Um, those will be the two, challenge, the two big challenges. Um, but we also have obviously all the challenges associated with um, climate change and the um, threats to global security that will come from that. There will be wars uh, for control of scarce resources. It's going to be a very difficult century. And I think, what we need now is not to try and predict exactly where those are going to come from, but to go on keeping our organisations so flexible that they're ready for everything that, can, that the century can throw at them. David? I, I agree with that in, entirely. You can see uh, obvious threats uh, continuing from terrorism, from uh, hostile states, but you can also, I think, sense that uh, climate change will bring tensions between states. It'll bring uh, quite possibly large scale population movements. Uh, you can see that extreme weather events, natural phenomena are nevertheless going to uh, uh, cause us considerable dislocation. And it's precisely at those moments that an adversary state may well try and take advantage of the uh, uh, distraction or disarray that we're in. The lesson to all of that, I think, is building up resilience as a nation, an all of nation effort just to toughen ourselves up um, for the uh, undoubted challenges that are ahead. Well, it's been uh, fascinating to speak to you. Really appreciate your insight today. Sir Francis Richards, Sir David Oman, former directors of GCHQ. Thanks so much for joining us on Times Radio.